Well, good morning, everybody. This is Mark Edelman, speech language pathologist, and welcome. Welcome to the teaching of talking, and welcome to these live lessons that we'll be presenting to you on Facebook. And they're going to be just jam packed with information. You know, when I was thinking about this subject, for this, uh, for this group of lessons, uh, I thought about, oh man, what, 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 what should we do? And I came up with an idea uh, and called it aphasia from soup to nuts. <laughs> but anyway, good morning. We're in uh, Middletown, New York, and we're out in the middle of the woods here because this is like the only place that has really good internet, and uh, it's a beautiful place. The only problem is we've got little mosquitoes around here. So if you see me batting a few mosquitoes here and there, don't worry. I don't have any ticks. I don't have any brain damage. It's just something from being out here with, with maybe some mosquitoes. So I'm really glad to see everybody. I see my good friend, uh, Barbara Lambert is here. Oh, is she a good friend and a confidant and a wonderful person. And uh, gosh, it's great to see you here, Barbara. So we're going to talk about aphasia. And uh, before we start talking about aphasia, we're going to talk about apraxia. Now, you might say to me, Mark, why, why do you want to talk about apraxia first? Well, Apraxia is something that occurs along with aphasia for many people. And of course, aphasia is a is diminished ability to understand language for some. So, so what it is is sometimes people have trouble understanding what's being said to them when they have an aphasia. But not only that, they also have difficulty, many of them, have difficulty expressing themselves if they have aphasia. Sometimes they, it's almost like they forget how to speak. It's almost like they forget the words that they want to say and the words just don't come. And so it's, it's a terrible problem, aphasia. It usually occurs with strokes, and um, quite often people are no longer able to go back to work. Quite often there may be some paralysis, difficulty walking, difficulty talking, sometimes even difficulty swallowing sometimes difficulty understanding. So people who unfortunately have strokes and aphasia are in somewhat of a pickle and they need extensive rehabilitation, quite often physical rehabilitation, uh, speech rehabilitation, occupational therapy, for limbs, sometimes an arm can be paralyzed, a leg can, a leg can be paralyzed. So there's extensive, extensive rehabilitation that occurs for many with aphasia. And aphasia also, sometimes it's a mild case where a, difficult, where a person has difficulty expressing themselves. They can, they can kind of talk but every once in a while they get stuck on a word. And uh, then there are others who only speak just a very minimal amount. Now what this Facebook Live uh, class that we're going to have all through September, we're going to cover a phaser from soup to nuts, and you're going to learn, gosh, a ton of information about aphasia. Now, Getting back to what I was saying about apraxia, I got to tell you this because, you know, you, you have to know where I'm coming from. And Cat Riddle, it's good to see you. And Diana, 
It's great to see you too. So you got to know where I'm coming from, okay? I've been doing this gig for, gosh, 45 years. Can you believe that? And, and I had some great, great, great training. And uh, so one of the first patients I ever had was a little boy, and he had apraxia. And again, I want to say that apraxia occurs often with people who have aphasia also, but not in all of them, okay? Now, an apraxia is difficult, having difficulty moving your lips and your tongue to make sounds of speech. So, if you've lost the ability to manipulate your tongue for speech sounds, T and D and N and L and S. Hello, cat. And uh, if you've lost that ability, uh, you're, you're in another pickle because aphasia is where you forget the words and apraxia is where you have difficulty moving the speech motor. Articulation or the production of sounds is not very accurate. And sometimes speech can kind of sound like mush. So I'm glad, first of all, that everybody is, is coming in on the call. I hope you'll say hello uh, to your fellows with, with a little uh, yell out and tell us where you're from and whether or not you're a, a caregiver or whether or not you're a therapist or a family member. That way we can... Um, gear the presentation. So anyway, here I am. I get this great traineeship to go to Miami, okay? And, and I went to the University of Miami Mailman Center for Child Development, which was part of the School of Medicine. And so one of my first patients was a little boy, and he had apraxia, and when he tried to talk, it was mush. Now, I got to be honest with you, okay? I didn't know what to do. Hi, Robin. I had no idea what to do with this kid. And uh, I was a graduate student. And um, so we had to do a project for our graduate degree. And so I had this kid who had apraxia, and I couldn't understand a word he could say. And it was my job to... <laughs> make him better. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to be transparent with you all now. You got you to gotta understand that. I want to be fully transparent. But I didn't know what the heck to do. I had no idea what to do. So uh, I submitted the paper that I was going to do music therapy with this kid to get him talking better. So uh, he was a little African-American kid. He was about seven or eight. And at that time, Michael Jackson was just coming out, and, and Michael Jackson was the thing. So <clears throat> I found a record by Michael Jackson that every kid knew, and just about everybody in America knew. It was got to be there, okay? And would you believe that for like two months... Our therapy was singing that darn song. <laughs> now, now you might ask, well, did he get any better? And I've got to be honest with you. I've got to say, probably not. I just didn't know what to do. And you know something else? I didn't have really, I didn't really have strong mentorship. I did not have strong mentorship. And you know, I was in a program with four people and three professors for like six months. Can you believe that? Three, three PhD professors who were supposed to train us to work with apraxia and childhood aphasia and other kinds of problems like that. But 
guess what? Michael Jackson just didn't do it for aphasia or apraxia. And Jeff, it's good to see you. So then I figured, gosh, what am I going to do to help this kid? So after the project was over, then there were the flashcards. So we, back then we had these big old boxes, okay? They were called Peabody Language Development Kits. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay? And they were made out of metal, and they weighed about 10 pounds, and you opened them up, and inside there would be about two or 300 picture cards. So then I thought, well, maybe that's the way I'm going to help the kid talk. <laughs> Now, I teach by storytelling, if that's okay with you, but I'm going to tell you what, and if you listen real close, I'm very serious with you right now, there is a jam-packed amount of information in these stories that I don't even want you to think about because I'm making a point, okay? But guess what? The flashcards didn't work at all. I mean, you know, I, I could say the word and he'd try to say it and it would still come out mush. Well, did the flashcards help him? No, not really. I really hadn't really learned a lot about speech pathology by that time. But being a student, I was kind of young, dumb, and stupid. <laughs> but I really wanted to help that kid. So anyway, I left University of Miami Mailman Center and got some really good training there, but I really didn't know how I was going to use it. Well, then I came to a place called Lakeland, Florida, and I started working in the school system with children who were mentally handicapped, teaching them how to talk. And that was a lot more fun. And I had some pretty good ideas of what to do by that time. And um, we were able to get a lot of those kids talking better. It's all about modeling. And Lynn, good to see you. And I'm glad you're here. And um, so I spent about a year and a half in the public schools and decided that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do some formal speech therapy and private practice. And I wanted to work with doctors and I wanted to work with neurologists. So I opened up a private practice and I got to be friends with some general practice doctors and some neurologists and they started sending me patients with strokes. Now, I hadn't really worked a lot with strokes either by that time when I was first opening up my practice. And see, that's another one of the things you got to know. One of the things you really got to know is that when you're first starting out as a speech pathologist, I don't, I don't care how much training you have, you don't really, you don't really know a whole lot, and you're, you're not practiced. So, so when they say uh, going into practice, that's really true. You, you practice and you try to help people speak better, and some you do and some you don't, but guess what? You learn a whole lot. So what were they doing back then, uh, 40 years ago, <laughs> when dealing with people with aphasia? Well, they had these big, thick workbooks. They were about this thick. And um, there was Brubaker, and there was home health care books. And you'd open up these books, and they'd have a whole lot of exercises in them. They'd have fill in the blank. They'd have finish the phrase. They'd have you counting. They'd have you singing. They'd have you doing all of these things. And, and uh, I did those things with uh, the people who came to see me who had strokes and aphasia. 
I did, I did those things, and we had a good time, and I, I loved doing it. But, you know, all of that time while I was doing those workbooks and those flashcards, there was this little part of me that came from deep down inside my body, and it was going, I don't really like this stuff. I don't think I'm really helping them talk. Oh, I'm helping them say words. Um, let me check real quick. There's, uh, Lynn is saying that she's having difficulty seeing or hearing the video. Can some of you kind of just give me a, a signal as to whether or not um, they're getting the uh, video, if they can hear and if they can see? Could some of you give me some feedback on that, please? I've got a plus over there from one person, and I see Barbara, and she's got a plus, uh, and I see another person, uh, Marley says she can't hear and see, and Debbie says no problems, and Terry says I can hear and see, and Ruben says clear video and audio, oh man, okay, well, I could, well, and Diana says she's doing okay. It may be because your internet may be slow. So what you want to do, anybody who's having difficulty, you're going to want to, I, I can't correct that right now from here because I, I can't control that. But you're going to want to get a better internet signal. And I think that would probably um, help you. Okay? So anyway, um, going back to speech and uh, language stimulation with people who had aphasia. And I'm giving you a little bit of history here because it's very important. And many of you may be going, yeah, that's what kind of happened with me. But I went through all the workbooks. And then, uh, you know, 10 minutes before the patient was to come in, uh, I'd grab a workbook. I'd start leafing through. I'd think about what kind of exercise I could give them, and that would be the speech therapy uh, session for that day. But deep down inside of my body, deep down inside, and through every corpuscle of my body, I didn't like it. I felt the same way in Miami when I was there working with a kid with apraxia, and for many years in private practice, working with people who had aphasia, I really wasn't sold. <laughs> Honest. I really wasn't sold on almost everything that the literature was saying you had to do. Everybody and, and all the journals, they were advertising flashcards. They were advertising speech and language development kits. Ah, good to see you, Tony and Lisa. And uh, they were advertising all of these things. And, you know, speech therapists buy them all up. They buy the workbooks. They buy the, the big kits. Then there's the kit that's about, about this big. And you open it up, and there inside is a spoon and a fork and a cup and a washcloth and a pencil and a pen and a pair of glasses and a hammer and a screwdriver. And speech therapists are supposed to do speech therapy with that. Well, I tried it. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I tried it, but I wasn't sold. So, then in about 1997, after about 15 years of doing uh, aphasia therapy with the workbooks and the flashcards and the handout sheets, uh, I was, I was really um, reaching an impasse. And so I was working in a rehabilitation hospital. And one day, a therapist came to see me. And she said, Mark, she said, would you see Leo for me? And I said, uh, Sarah, uh, why do you want me to see your patient? 
And uh, Sarah said, well, he smells. <laughs> he smells bad. And um, so I go, okay. And she said, besides that, I can't understand a word he says. So I said, okay, Sarah, I owe you one, so I'll go see him. So I brought my speech workbooks and my flashcards and a whole box of other stuff. And I went up to see Leo, who's this kind of old guy, and he's sitting in a wheelchair kind of like this, and he's drooling all over the place. I mean... He's got a towel that's stuck in his mouth and it's collecting saliva. And um, Sarah was right. The room smelled terrible. <laughs> so I was thinking, gosh, what am I going to do with this guy? So... I take out one of my workbooks and open it up and sit across from this guy and I start asking him questions and things and he looks up at me, <laughs> rolls his eyes and then he goes back to sitting like this. Well... <clears throat> That went on for like 30 minutes, because that's how long my visit was, 30 minutes. And he wouldn't look at me for 30 minutes. And I had to stay there for 30 minutes because I had to do, he was my patient, and that was the therapy session. So he almost fell asleep, and I almost fell asleep. <laughs> and that's really bad. A therapist should never fall asleep when doing therapy. <clears throat> But sometimes it happens, especially when you have a patient who's not responding. So to make a long story short, I was building a house at that time. And I was having a whole lot of deliberations with the builder about the thickness of the plywood in the roof and the plumbing fixtures and all this other kind of stuff. And um, so a couple of days later, I was in the room again with Leo. And um, so I was just sitting there, and he wasn't responsive, and I was about ready to let him go. And then I started talking to him. And I said, Leo, sorry you can't talk with me, but I got a problem. I just got, you know, I just got back from lunch, and I have a roof, and um, one guy's telling me it should be... Uh, three-fifths of an inch thick, and another guy's telling me it's supposed to be three-quarters of an inch thick. And all of a sudden, he came up like this, and he lit up like a Christmas tree. And uh, for the first time in like an hour and a half of spending time with this guy, I had his attention. And, um, and then I found out that he was a carpenter, of all things. Well, from that time on... Leo and I would have conversations. They first started out with one word, and as he, we would talk, the saliva would just drip down over the towel that was wrapped around his neck. And then I suggested to him that when he wasn't talking, just to close his lips <laughs> and swallow. But anyway... Make a long story short, Leo and I became the best of friends. I was able to help him go first from a one-word reply and then to a two-word reply with about a second rest in between each word. And then we went to three-word phrases like that and then four words. And within four weeks... He was speaking so that I could understand him, and he was speaking so that the nursing staff could understand him, and he felt confident about speaking. And that's when I learned 
the first lesson about speech and language stimulation with someone who has apraxia or aphasia. Now, Dale Carnegie, I'm a graduate of, of Dale Carnegie, and one of the first laws that you learn in the process of how to win friends and influence people, the first one, is take a sincere interest in the other person. Hey, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Take a sincere interest in the other person. Hi, Tammy. And um, so I did. And then I found out a lot about Leo, that he was a very successful carpenter in Polk County, Florida. And um, then he was able to speak. And he was able to speak very, very slowly, very slowly. He had some dysarthria also. And dysarthria, for many of you who don't know, is slurred speech. So he had some aphasia. He had some apraxia where he had difficulty moving his tongue and his lips. And he had the dysarthria, which was slurred speech. So at that point, I figured, hmm, maybe all I really need to do is meet a person who's got aphasia and find out who they are, find out what their interests are, find out what they're passionate about, find out what they like, what they dislike, and that's, and those are the words that you work on in therapy. <laughs> no flashcards, you know, no worksheets. Because one of the things I learned was that the flashcards and the worksheets, they interrupted the relationship. Do you see? There was no, there was no real one-on-one -on -one contact, really. There was no meeting of the minds. There was no getting to know each other. There was no conversation. It was just do this, or do that, or do this, or do that. And you know something? A lot of people with aphasia don't care for therapy like that. And they don't like it. And you know something? I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit, but I did it for so long because I had no idea what else to do. And what I had seen in the literature, and I went to seminars... And I couldn't find anything that I thought really made any sense to me. <laughs> and that's all that there was to it. So then I started uh, for the next uh, year or two or three, I started working with people with aphasia, getting to know them, talking with them, uh, uh, helping them say the words that they wanted to say, uh, help them say all the very important words. And then what I did is I figured, you know, they're forgetting a lot of this stuff. I'd come back for the next visit and they'd be forgetting a lot of that stuff. So I'd have their caregiver in the room or their wife or their husband, and I'd have them working right along with me and I would teach them exactly what to do. I would teach them exactly what to do and they had to be in the therapy room with me. And I would stimulate a word or a phrase or a sentence and then I would have the care partner do the same thing. And I would start very simply, maybe one word, maybe two words, that's all. Make it very, very, very simple. Because the simpler you make it, and the easier it is for the person with aphasia to do and to say, well, they'll, they'll feel confident. They'll feel confident and they'll like working and they'll like speaking because somebody somewhere knows what to do to help them talk. Now, so the next part 
of the story. And, and this is a very important part because without it, you'd have uh, no real background about who I am or how this was all developed because I want to share with you a great method that helps people talk. So I left working at nursing homes and rehab centers and then I got a call one day from a hospital that wanted a speech language pathologist so I went out there. And so I started working at this hospital and within the first week that I was there there were three new patients all who had recent strokes and all who had uh, families um, in that city who were very very important and I trained those caregivers to help their loved ones talk in therapy just about every day and I made it a requirement for them to be there and they made good progress and at the end of 13 weeks when my contract was up they asked me to come back and work some more so I did and I worked another 13 weeks and I worked with those same three people and they were getting better and a lot of the other patients we were seeing were getting better because we got them talking by talking. <laughs> isn't that, that makes common sense, isn't it? If you're going to learn, if you're going to teach somebody to talk, well, you talk with them. You don't necessarily give them a bunch of stuff. You know, it's like people who go to a foreign country. They get absorbed there. They hear the language and they just start using it. Nobody does flashcards with them or uh, gives them uh, uh, speech notebooks. And that's how kids learn too. Children learn to speak by having a mother who says words all through the day in all kinds of activities with that child. You know, from baba to mama to dada to bed uh, to wah, wah, wah. And, and every time a mother interacts with the baby, quite often it's natural for her to say a word and have the child repeat the word. And that's kind of the principle of the teaching of talking is it's very similar to guess what? How we learn to talk! <laughs> But I don't know why people think that they've got to have an iPad or they've got to have a notebook or they have to have a flashcards to learn to talk. I, you know, once, once I worked with Leo and found out what could happen and what a significant improvement that could occur, um, I was pretty much done with a lot of that stuff. Now, I'm not saying I never handed out papers. Or, or, or something to work on at home, but, but I never went back to that again. Now, I got to tell you this next one, okay? So they called me out to this hospital to work, and I worked temporarily 13 weeks. They, they called me back. They said, we want you to work another 13 weeks. So I worked with those same three people as well as a bunch of other patients and these three people were doing really well and I was training their, the caregivers to do exactly what I did and the caregivers, well, gosh, we had a great time. It was a great time. It was a great time because we talked, we talked about the family, we talked about all different things while stimulating speech from the person who had aphasia. Now, we had to use mirroring, which is where you sit about three feet away from somebody and you speak and you have them mirror what you're saying. I mean, there's just a whole lot of techniques that I'm going to be reviewing with you. So anyway, I spent the first 13 weeks, then they had me come back for another 13 weeks, I saw the same three, three and some more, and then my second 13 weeks was up. 
So I got in my car and I drove back to Lakeland, Florida, where I lived. And about two days later, I get a phone call from the same hospital. And they asked me if I would come out and meet with a family member and talk to them about setting up a special program for their loved ones who had aphasia. They had what we call a broca's aphasia, which is where a person can imitate, but they have difficulty initiating speech. So <clears throat> I go out and I meet with this person and uh, I, I meet them at, at their home and uh, I sit down next to that person and the person says to me, uh, Mark, if, if money was no object, what would you, what would you devise, what, what would you dream up to help our loved ones get their speaking back? If money was no object, <laughs> and I went, holy camoly, if money was no object? And so I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it for about a minute. <laughs> and uh, so she looked at me and said, do you have the answer so soon? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, would you mind sharing it with me? And she had this real puzzled look on her face. And I could tell that, that she was having a difficult time kind of understand, understanding that, that I'd really come up with the answer very quickly. And here's what I told her. I, I said, if, if you want your loved one to really do well, then... I'm going to have to move in with you. <laughs> yeah, I said I'm going to have to live I'm going to have to live with you because that's the only way you're going to get that person talking again by having somebody in the home, okay, who knows what they're doing, who's stimulating speech all day long because speech therapy two or three times a week for half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour just doesn't cut it. And you've heard me say that before. I'm sure many of you have. And it doesn't. And in most cases in America today and throughout, even, even internationally, they don't teach caregivers what to do to help their patients or their spouses or their loved ones speak. The, the person with aphasia goes into a room, the door's closed, and the spouse quite often, and not in all cases now, not in all cases, will go to Walmart and then come back five minutes before the session is over and come into the room and maybe she'll get some handout sheets to do or some flashcards or something like that. So getting back to the story. <laughs> so she said, "Well, let me give let me give you that some thought. Let me give it. Let me give let me give you some thought." So, Kellyanne, nice nice seeing you on the call. So, um, uh, <laughs> she gave it some thought, and um, and then she called me a couple of days later, and she said. <sighs> I've got some people who want to meet with you, and I've set up a time. Would next week at a certain time at a certain place be okay? And I said, fine. So I met with probably about four or five people, and they all looked at me like I was from outer space. And they all asked me to explain what I thought would be the best way to help a person with aphasia talk if money was no object. And I said, again, I said, I'd have to move in with them. I'd have to get up with them in the morning. 
I'd stimulate them to pick out exactly what they were going to wear. I'd stimulate them to, to tell me what they were doing when they were brushing their teeth or when they were shaving or when they were getting dressed or what they were going to pick out to wear or what they were putting on or where we were going next to the kitchen or what we were going to have for breakfast, the coffee or the rolls or the cereal. Every little thing I told them that that person with aphasia has, I would be stimulating them, whether it be in a single word, a phrase, or a sentence, depending on the severity of their aphasia, I would be stimulating them to speak in conversation, in real time, with real objects, in real situations, you see, <laughs> so <clears throat> I made that presentation to those people and they liked it and so then we thought well yeah yeah but we've got three or four people who need this so so I said well then what we have to do is we have to find a place where those three or four people can live and have CNAs and family members coming in there and learning how to stimulate speech and language and stimulating their speech and language in all their activities every day. So guess what we did? We found a assisted living facility and we were able to get scholarships for these four people and they came to this facility and were there residentially. We had two CNAs that I trained how to stimulate speech and language and they were really, really, really good and we had a couple of um, uh, wives and husbands who attended every day these classes and these classes were from 7 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. And a lot of it was talking. Was talking. We talked about world events. We talked about all of these. And since there were only three or four, I could stimulate each and every one of them. And so could the CNAs to say single words, phrases, and sentences. All around conversation. No flashcards no workbooks, no iPads, none of that stuff. And that's how that idea happened. And after working with those three people for three years, I did a research paper and presented it and showed that intensive speech therapy works, especially if a caregiver or a wife or a husband could learn the techniques that took me decades to learn and to utilize that at home. <laughs> All right, so then what happened? All right, well then I started teaching CFYs. I went to Houston and I got uh, Jobs for about 10 years in some of the best rehab hospitals in the country. And I started utilizing these techniques with the patients who came to see me. And they loved the therapy. They just loved it. And they all did well. And they all had to bring their, their spouses into the therapy room. And we would take turns. I'd stimulate a, a word or a phrase or a sentence, and then the caregiver did, or the uncle did, or the cousin did, whoever brought that person to therapy. And these people got very, very good at stimulating speech and language. And you know something? Progress was just unbelievable. 
while everybody else was doing their workbooks and their flashcards, I'd be looking at them and say, why don't you just get them talking? But they say, oh, no, no, we have to do cognitive work, cognitive work. Well, a lot of times I'm, I don't buy into that because cognition occurs when language improves. Cognition is low when language is low. So you work on the language and the cognition improves often, okay? And not only that, but you know, a lot of these people with strokes and aphasia also had receptive language difficulties. But you know something? When you're stimulating them all day long and helping them say single words, phrases, and sentences, their ears get better. Their listening gets better. And soon their listening gets very good. It's just like their speech. At first they can't say anything. And quite often at first they can't comprehend anything. And then once they start saying a word, then it, we know that they can hear that word. So they start hearing that word. So we say the word and they imitate the word or the phrase or the sentence. And those with aphasia soon improve both their listening. <clears throat> and you don't have to do any special listening exercises. Heck, it's just a part of the therapy. And you don't have to do, with most of the patients I saw, you don't have to do spend weeks and weeks and weeks on cognitive therapy that doesn't improve speaking at all. You work on the speaking. And as you improve the speaking, the language improves. As the language improves, the cognition improves. As the language improves, the listening improves. The comprehension improves. <clears throat> because it's a constant give and take, 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 give and take. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. All day long. And they get better. Okay. So, then i got to tell you about another experience, because th this is just the foundation that I want to set with you. And within this foundation is a multitude, or are a multitude, of lessons for you. Okay? So, I was on the internet one time. I was in, I think it was, uh, uh, Speech Pathologists at Large. <laughs> now don't call me large now. <laughs> and so I was talking about the teaching of talking. And this one speech pathologist says, Oh, you're full of baloney. You just want to sell everybody on your product. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, we know people like you. So I had to have a discussion with my friend Stephen Charlton, who's a doctor of speech pathology, and the two of us had this heated interaction online for about an hour, and by the end of that hour, he understood what I was talking about. And a couple of days later, Stephen Charlton Dr. Stephen Charlton invited me to come out to Cal State to help teach a course to his graduate students in speech pathology. That was wonderful. But you know what one of the most wonderful things was? <clears throat> so I, t I helped teach the class. And so in the beginning, when the students had their practicum, you know, they were, they were kind of doing that same old, same old. <laughs> so we had to have, I had to have a meeting, uh, uh, a meeting with, uh, you know, I, I had to have a special meeting with each one of them. And then we started to go to work on me training them what to do with their patients who had aphasia. I want to tell you about the first 
woman who was a graduate student. She had this guy. He loved Texas Hold'em. <laughs> and he tried to talk so fast, and every time he tried to talk, he'd trip over himself, and he could never finish, he could never even finish a statement. Hi, Rusty. My good friend Rusty there. Uh, you know, there's so many people on this call who I love. Uh, previous patients. My wife is even on this call. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, so here's this graduate student, you know, who was doing in the beginning. What is this? Is this a cat? Yes. Say cat. Is this a dog? Say cat. Is this a bird? Say bird. Is this coffee? Say coffee. You know, that therapy went out in the Stone Age, all right? <clears throat> so we started teaching them about the teaching of talking. And within just a couple of visits, he was teaching her how to play Texas Hold'em in one and two word utterances and she was able to write down from what he was trying to say all of the steps of playing Texas Hold'em. Now she didn't know how to play Texas Hold'em so she had to play like she didn't know anything which she didn't know anything about Texas Hold'em. So what happened was that they'd come in the husband with the wife and the student therapist, and I'd be in the back behind the, 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 the mirror in the dark room listening. <laughs> now I could stay awake. Now I could stay awake because there was something interesting to watch. When I first watched them do that old traditional stuff, I'd be asleep in about two minutes. But anyway, this therapist who nobody thought she was going to be able to do any good with this person, within just a few visits was getting single words, two word pairs, and three word phrases from this guy about how to play Texas Hold'em. And you know something? He loved coming to therapy. And not only did he love coming to therapy, but his wife loved coming to therapy. And most of all, the therapist who was so nervous and worried that I was going to fail her or whatever, she had a great time because she was understanding the fundamentals of speech and language stimulation. Now, speech and language stimulation, what is it? It's about stimulating the other person to talk. And you know what the best way to get a person to talk is? Is to ask them a question. Just ask them a question. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's not quite as simple as that. And that's why I'm going to walk you through aphasia from soup to nuts. <laughs> Some of my patients used to say, well, Mark, you're one of them. <laughs> and I used to say, I know. But I'm transparent. I like to have a good time. Hey, look, I've been doing speech therapy 45 years already. Now, if I didn't love it, if I didn't love helping people, if I didn't love training caregivers and therapists how to help their loved ones speak better, I wouldn't be doing this. Now, I got one quick story left to tell you. And then we'll, then we'll be done. So... I got married about eight years ago or so. I was single for 10 years. I was married for 30 years. I was single for 10 years. 
and then I got married. And uh, I was getting ready to leave hospital practice. And uh, stuttering, St this can help persons stutter too. You have to be a model. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to uh, Demula, last name Demula. J just let me say this, that, that what speech therapy is and what speech and language stimulation is, is modeling. Now, you might say to me, Mark, what's modeling? I'll get to that in one of the next classes. But modeling is where you show the person how to say what they need to say in a way that's clear. You have to show them exactly how to speak. And with children who, who stutter, quite often they speak way too fast. You have to slow them way, 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 way down. And there's ways of doing that without getting them frustrated. But I'm going to take questions in just a minute. Just let me finish this story and then I'll answer some questions, okay? And I might even stay a few extra minutes, okay? So anyway, my wife said to me, look, I know you want to write a book. I know you're leaving hospital uh, uh, therapy very soon. And uh, she said, I know you want to write about the techniques that you've developed. She said, I'll tell you what, I'll do everything around the house. I'll feed the dog. I'll shampoo the dog. I'll clean the house. I'll do everything. You won't have to lift a finger. But when the book's done, when it's published, then you take me traveling. <clears throat> and that's why the teaching of talking, we're traveling all over the place. In fact, in about two weeks, we're heading to Las Vegas, and we're going to be going through a lot of different states. And if you'd like us to stop by and you're on the way, we'll stop by and visit with you, and we'll visit maybe with a stroke club. But anyway, um, that's why we have a motorhome, and that's why we travel all over the country, because I made my wife a promise that if she'd let me write my book and would leave me alone <laughs> so that I could share it with people all over the world and help train people all over the world and in the United States and train people all over the United States uh, that we'd have to have a vehicle. And that's what we're doing now. We lecture all over the country and, and even over across the pond in England where, we, where, where we've done some training. And we hope to do some other trainings in other English-speaking countries. So <clears throat> that's about it for this, this session. Um, I, I wanted to share with you um, who I am and... Uh, how I got to be where I am. You know, there's a ton of lessons that I shared with you today, and they were all disguised, all disguised in this story. And um, I'm going to have a, a, a teaching of talking resource page on Facebook. And uh, so any of you who are really serious, uh, I mean really serious about learning uh, how to do the teaching of talking, um, you, can, you can go sign up on that resource page. And, and that's a free page, too. And uh, I am going to have all kinds of free information for you. And uh, so that you can first decide whether or not you like me, whether or not you trust me, whether or not you think that what I'm sharing with you makes sense, because you know something, caregivers all over the world are in a total uh, stupor about what to do to help their loved ones with aphasia. And you know, I've been practicing this long enough that I can show you techniques to help with dysarthria, apraxia, aphasia, and aphasia even with the other two. And so we'll get to all of that on the next uh, Facebook Live, which will be tomorrow, tomorrow evening at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'm going to be speaking about 
how you will know if your loved one is a good subject for aphasia therapy or the teaching of talking. Uh, I'm going to help you understand whether or not you could even do it. You know, I've had so many caregivers say, no, 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 I can't do that. You do that. That's what I'm paying you for. That's what the hospital's hiring you for. But guess what? It'll never happen. Significant improvement for a, 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 a severe to profound problem will never happen if you just go to therapy a couple days a week. It just won't happen because we all forget. And many of you have seen my video on forgetting. We all forget. And so that's why it's very important that language be stimulated, the same language each and every day in almost every single activity. So I want to come to your house and live with you. And I'll do that if you allow me to help train you. And then when you're doing the therapy at home, you'll say, hey, this is just like Mark did it. And you'll know that I'm right there in spirit, right with you. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, now, Alejandro, she has aphasia. And sorry, what time tomorrow? 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And... Uh, that's what time tomorrow our class will be. Now, I, I don't know where I'm going to be because just about every time that you're going to be in class, I'm, I'm going to be somewhere. Who knows? I may be here. I may be on the road. I may be at a truck stop. I may be anywhere, but I'll make you this promise. I will do everything within my integrity to be there for you when I say I'm going to be there. And only in case of a dire emergency or an internet blackout will I not be there. Okay, now, <clears throat> now I'll take questions. Now, I've seen a whole lot of questions and a lot of comments. And now I'll take questions, and I'll try to answer them really fast. I'll do it for about five or ten minutes real quick, okay? And so one person says, uh, let's see, Heather says thanks. Um, any questions? or anything that you'd like to share with me um, by texting, okay? And if you have it, it says, if you are not able to be on a certain time cause of work, is there somewhere we can get the video? Yes, the video will be on the Teaching of Talking page. And the, and the video will be up there today for this particular session. And then tomorrow, when I do tomorrow's, tomorrow night, then you look on the page for tomorrow's class. Okay, so there will always be a copy of the video. It says, uh, Mark, methods work. My, oh, so somebody was just giving me a testimonial. <laughs> And let's say, do you believe there is a time limit on teaching someone who has aphasia and apraxia? No. No. No such thing. No such thing at all. <laughs> That's poppycock. And it really is. Because as long as a person has a desire to get better, and as long as a person has that desire and is willing to work with, with me or work with the, the wife or the husband or whoever it is, you could, you could be stimulating speech from now till forever, okay? And in some cases, you may have to do that, okay? So, so just know that there's no time limit. There's no six months. And uh, usually they say that, that uh, you're not going to get better uh, after six months, because that's usually when the therapy runs out. <laughs> and that gives them an excuse, okay? People can improve their speaking for, for months and months and years. Okay, uh, let's see. Rusty, thanks, Mark. I love your work. Uh, Tony, I've been using the teaching of talking method with my stroke patients. Your method is very effective. Oh, okay. Well, good, good, good. Well, 
I'm going to uh, get on out of here, as they say in Texas, get on out of here pretty soon in about another minute or two. And, and um, I want to invite all of you to the Teaching of Talking family. I, I, I take, uh, take it personally. Hi, does aphasia affect one's ability to communicate by text message or operate? Yes, yes. Quite often people who have aphasia, um, they can't use a computer anymore or, or a smartphone or texting because aphasia also is, is an expressive problem. You express yourself, you speak, but the other way you express yourself is with writing. And quite often if speaking is affected, so is your writing or your texting. Okay. So uh, that's about all the time and questions I have today. Um, if you want to send me a question, uh, send it to, let's see, thank you, you're a hoot. I look forward to seeing more from you in the hopes to help my husband along. Yes, we're going to help your husband along. Yes, ma'am. And uh, so if you have any specific questions, you can put them here on Facebook <clears throat> or you can um, send me a email at talkwithmark1, number one, talkwithmark1, all one word, at gmail.com, talkwithmark1, all, all one word, at gmail.com. And on that, I would like to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this privilege and it truly is a privilege to share with you what I know so that more and more people throughout this country and the world can improve speaking. So I'd like to say Arrivederci, Sayonara, I love you, uh, I thank you, and I look forward to seeing who's ever on the call tomorrow. Remember, <coughs> Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8.30 Eastern Daylight Time and Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're doing classes five days a week. And so the sun is kind of blinding me. It's kind of hard to see my screen. But um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye now. <laughs>